Uh, I want to welcome everybody here. I'm Susan Kokendo, uh, one of the coordinators of the Baruch movement in the Midwest. Um, I want to start with an image. Uh, it's already up there. But I want you to look carefully at the image on the red t-shirt right here. The guy holding the camera. Do people see what that is? That's right. It's John Kennedy wearing a Donald Trump cap. Uh, we took this uh, at the Grand Rapids Trump rally a couple of weeks ago. Now, what I want to do uh, is I'm going to make an assertion. And the assertion is that there is a figure who bridges the gap between John Kennedy and Donald Trump. Uh, that figure is Linda LaRouche, who is, I think everybody knows, passed away about two months ago at the age of 96. Um, and what we're now seeing with Trump's, shall we say, liberation from the Mueller witch hunt is a resurgence of optimism in this country, uh, which evokes the optimism that we had, those of us old timers, had in the 1960s when John Kennedy was president, uh, was committed to ending colonialism, uh, was committing our, this nation to landing on the moon by the end of the decade. That, that optimism has been under attack by the British Empire. It's taken every form you can imagine. The assassination of President Kennedy, the unleashing of the counterculture in this country, the post-industrial policies which have led to the destruction of our science, our manufacturing, and our industry. And while most people have capitulated to this, gone along with it, perhaps opposed it in the solitude of their own minds and so on, one man continued the fight throughout these decades, and I would say has been the transmission belt for the fight to defend the American nation and the American presidency from the attacks by the British Empire. And that man is Lyndon LaRouche. I would submit that Donald Trump would not be president uh, had it not been for the fight that Lyndon LaRouche fought. I think that may be shocking to many people, but my intention in this discussion today is to try and give you a, a sense of how that indeed is the case. Now, let me tell you what the agenda for the meeting is going to be. Um, I'm going to address this question of LaRouche's role in this arc from the Kennedy presidency to where we stand today. Uh, Bill Roberts is then going to address some of the more um, the inside of LaRouche's economic policies from the standpoint of what he has always called, what Mr. LaRouche has called the machine tool principle. You can smile now, right? <laughs> Larry just got a job in the machine tool point. Um, uh, and then the third part of our discussion is going to be how can we expand these ideas and use a, special, a, a particular sweep of time, because on June the 8th, we will be celebrating the life of Lyndon LaRouche with a memorial uh, event in New York City with satellite events throughout the United States so that as many people as possible can, can participate in celebrating the contributions and the life of Lyndon LaRouche. We are calling this the triumph of LaRouche because in a sense we have to look backward at what he has done, what he did with his life, well, it will be that, but it's more looking forward to the fact that we are on the verge of his economic policies becoming the driving force on this whole planet. They're already a driving force in many places, which we'll, we'll, we'll speak of, but obviously the United States is the key, and I believe that if we can put Lyndon LaRouche's ideas into Donald Trump's hands, <coughs> we'll be at a tremendous breakout point for this nation and for the world. Now, the British, the British, well, let me put it this way. We've just gone through a two-year attempted coup d'etat 
against the President of the United States. Uh, the release of the Mueller report, his findings that there was no collusion, there was no obstruction, as mealy mouthed as he was, brings to an end a now highly exposed British attempt to overthrow the President of the United States. And I would say that the British went to great risks because they saw in the election and the initial weeks of President Trump's uh, presidency the potential revival of this Kennedy outlook uh, uh, in the United States. And I just want to reference two things that the President did immediately upon coming into office. Uh, number one, he gave a wonderful speech from the Oval Office, and some of you have seen it because we've shown it a few times at these meetings, recommitting our nation to the exploration of space, to the fact that man is driven by the, the impulse to discover new things in the universe. It wasn't even so much about our manned space program, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. It was about the Hubble telescope. It was about the fact that we're reaching into the depths of the universe to discover new principles which mankind can then use to exert greater dominion over nature. He did that. He also gave a number of speeches, and I'm just going to pass this around. We have a couple of excerpts. The president gave a number of speeches, one in Kentucky and I believe one in Ohio in which he did something which no president has done since William McKinley in 1902, 1901, before he was assassinated. And that is he spoke of the American system. He spoke of the American system of economy, which was the policies of Alexander Hamilton, the policies which, whether Trump put it in these terms or not, the policies which organized the economy around physical production and not monetary accumulation. Now, again, the last president to actually use the term American system was William McKinley, who was assassinated in 1901. The American system was the policy of Abraham Lincoln and James Garfield. They, too, were both assassinated. Um, and so it was, it was clear from the standpoint of the British that they had a problem. And so the witch hunt was unleashed against the president. Uh, and the, as I say, the British went to great lengths. They really put it all on the line to stop this president. Because they knew something else. They knew that this president was part of an international phenomenon. In fact, that's what Mr. LaRouche said the day after Trump was elected in 2016. He said this is not a domestic event. This is part of an international wave of nations trying to liberate themselves from a dying globalist system. And the British know that because they know that the Trump presidency is coming in a world where you also have the Putin presidency <coughs> in Russia and the Xi Jinping presidency in China and other world leaders in Japan and India and elsewhere who are rejecting the policies of globalization. So the combination of Trump's intentions and the world in which he became president spelled to the British that they could lose everything. And therefore, they were ready to commit everything. And they did. In this effort, as the president himself is called, to carry out a coup, treason, and so on. Now, what did we do? Uh, Emma, could you hold up a Mueller pamphlet? In 2000, uh, the end of 2017, we put out a pamphlet, August, thank you. We put out a pamphlet exposing the British hand behind not only the attacks on Trump, but the fact that it was the very same forces that had prosecuted LaRouche in the late 1980s, in particular Robert Mueller uh, by name. But one of the other people who was involved in the prosecution of LaRouche in the late 1980s was the just announced Republican opponent to Donald Trump. William Weld, the former Republican governor of Massachusetts, has just announced that he will be challenging Donald Trump. So it's a really a very small world. Uh, 
I don't think the enemy has that deep a well to draw from in terms of people who are ready to completely prostitute themselves. And we have hammered away for two years on the fact that this is the British, that they fear the reemergence of sovereign nations, strong sovereign nations working with each other toward the common aims of economic development and peace for mankind. Um, and by our unrelenting insistence that people look at the larger picture, look at the question of the British, there is now more discussion of the fact that it is the British government. And by, and with, by the British, I think most people here know, we're referring to the monarchy, the city of London, the British elite. We are not referring to the British people. They obviously are in a state of revolt against these policies, hence their effort to exit the, with the Brexit uh, process, which the elite are desperately trying to stop. Um, what has now happened, now that this Mueller uh, attack has been shut down, is the question of the British is more before the American population than we have ever seen in our decades of organizing. Um, I want to show you. This is from the Daily Caller. That's an online publication. Former British spymaster has flown under the radar in Russia for probe, despite links to key figures. This is the former head of MI6. I mean, everyone knows Christopher Steele was an MI6 agent. Richard, Sir Richard Dearwolf is at the top, was at the top. He's no longer there. He is one of the people who passed on the so-called Dodge dossier that got us on, on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that got us into that quagmire over the past decades and so on. But he now stands exposed as one of the principal <coughs> figures with ties to all of the key figures involved in the Russiagate attack. Um, Now, a year ago, most people didn't know who Richard Dearlove was, but there he is uh, there on the end. This is from a pamphlet that we circulated last year, our campaign to secure the future. And Emma, Bill, Hector, who have been out on the streets organizing people, they can tell you. They would open up to this pamphlet and they say, this is the head of MI6. These are the people who are running the attacks against the president. And now this is, in a sense, part of the political dialogue. Uh, many major commentators who wouldn't touch the question of the British with a 10-foot pole are now identifying the role of the British. People like Rush Limbaugh and others are finally getting religion and identifying the role of, of the British. Uh, the president himself, right before the release of the Mueller report, in a very understated way, and we all know Donald Trump isn't exactly understated, but in a very understated way, let it be known that he knew what was going on. He retweeted a tweet. Uh, the original tweet was from the very interesting Democratic candidate for president. She's one of the only ones who hasn't drunk the anti, or the Russia Day Kool-Aid, shall we say. Tulsi Gabbard, <clears throat> and she says, short-sighted politicians and media pundits who have spent the last two years accusing Trump as a Putin puppet have brought us the expensive new Cold War and arms race. How? Because Trump now does everything he can to prove he's not Putin's puppet, even if it brings us closer to war. That was then retweeted by this writer, William Craddock, who said, Russiagate was designed in part to help the UK counter Russian influence by baiting the U.S. into taking the hard line against us, leaves us all with a more dangerous world as a consequence. Just another episode of the great game. And for those who know history, the great game is what the British call geopolitics. You treat every nation as a pawn on the chessboard, and you just pit them against each other for the purpose of maintaining the control of this imperial elite, no matter what it does to countries. All you have to do is look at the Mideast and what we've done there in the past 20 years to get a sense of how little the British care about the consequences of their great game. But look who retweeted it at the very time. Donald J. Trump retweeted it. Didn't say anything about it, but just put it out there that he knows 
that indeed it is a bridge. So we've, we've made a significant breakthrough in this respect. But the coup attempt against the president is not the only weapon that the British use. They still have tremendous assets in terms of their control over our foreign policy. Because if anybody pays any attention, Donald Trump is the only person in his administration who does not call either Russia or China our moral enemies, who declares the urgent necessity of having normal relations with these other superpowers. And in fact, um, just 10 days ago, shortly after uh, the Mueller report was delivered to Attorney General Bill Barr, Trump was holding a press conference with uh, the deputy premier of China uh, on, on the question of the trade talks. And Trump, just in the middle of the press conference, said, look, I might be speaking out of turn here, but you realize the United States, Russia, and China spend hundreds of billions of dollars on weapons, and many of them are nuclear weapons. I think we should get together with each other and figure out how to rechannel those resources in ways which are peaceful and more productive. There is nobody else in his administration who has that posture. Pompeo, Bolton, Pence, they are out on the hustings every single day declaring that Russia and China are our mortal enemies, we better get ready for war, and so on. Now where are they getting that from? Well, let's go back to the British. In December of last year, the British House of Lords released a document, you can see the title there, but its basic thrust was, we've been able to maintain our control over the world by using the United States as our dumb giant. They call it the US-UK special relationship. And they say the special relationship is in grave danger because of Donald Trump. Then they go on to say, we can probably survive one term of Trump because we have a lot of capability, we have a lot of, they didn't use the word assets, but I'm gonna use the word assets in the United States, in the military community, the intelligence community, the Congress, the press, and so on. So they've as much as, much as admitted that they control this military foreign policy complex in the United States. Uh, and, and they said that they think they can survive one term of Trump, but not two because they very clearly understand that if he gets a second term, he is going to fire all these guys. We're recommending strongly he not wait till the second term and start firing people. Um, and in fact, we ourselves are carrying out a major initiative in this regard. I think everybody got a handout uh, regarding our dear friend, um, Bill Binney, the former technical director of the National Security Agency who quit many years ago because he saw that his work was being used not to stop terrorism, but to spy on Americans. And he's been a very, very important voice in the recent years. And now he has done the investigation in which he can prove that there was no hack of the DNC servers, that this was a download from inside DNC headquarters. And therefore, the entire fairy story that the Russians hacked the computers can be definitively proven to be false. Now, Mr. Biden, Donald Trump, two years ago, tasked his CIA director, who at that time was Pompeo, the current Secretary of State, to meet with Bill Biden to find out what Bill Biden had to say about this. Pompeo met with him, Biden gave him the evidence, and Pompeo did absolutely nothing. We could have shut down Mueller, the Mueller operation, especially with the Russia Gate side of it, two years ago, if Pompeo had done his job. Now, was Pompeo part of the team that wanted to overthrow Trump? I don't know. But Pompeo is certainly part of the establishment that wants to maintain the policy that Russia is our enemy and that this is a, a eternal conflict and therefore he did not want to disprove the question of Russia hacking uh, into our elections. 
We're engaged in a campaign right now to get Mr. Binney out there, to get interviews for him, get newspaper coverage for him, and so on. Because it's absolutely urgent that the, the next step after the shutting down of the Mueller investigation must be that to be the absolute understanding that Russia did not hack the DNC headquarters and, uh, and, and use that as a major step in terms of undercutting this British geopolitical great game of having the United States in constant conflict with Russia and China. The, the, the same has to be the case with China. Uh, this week, this coming week, China is holding its major Belt and Road Initiative summit with 35 heads of state in China uh, to further consolidate the absolutely dramatic um, economic miracle which has unfolded because of China's adoption, in essence, of Lyndon LaRouche's economic policies. That's a longer discussion. Perhaps we can get into that in the, in the question and answer period. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do at this point is, is a return to what I said at the outset, that the connection point between the optimism in the United States in the 1960s and Donald Trump's presidency is Lyndon LaRouche, who for nearly 50 years fought to defend the institution of the US presidency from the attacks of the British Empire. Mr. LaRouche himself ran presidential campaigns every four years from 1976 to 2004. But they were not individual campaigns. It was one campaign which intention was to defend this unique institution of the American presidency and to defend the American Republic from the British and from the British twofold policy. One was this perpetual conflict. And if you remember the Cold War era, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s until the crumbling of the Soviet Empire, Perpetual conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union could have, at any moment, triggered thermonuclear war. And any sane person knew that, and happily there were sane people in our establishment. Um, but Mr. LaRouche was one of the most public voices in terms of addressing this. Now, what I want to show you, first of all, is a very short video. Um, from 1976. This was Mr. I'm, I, it's going to be an excerpt. This uh, was Mr. LaRouche's first presidential campaign. Um, we purchased a half hour of national television time. Back then it was only about $100,000. And I remember being in our, our then headquarters in New York City, you know, having to deliver the $100,000 to CBS or NBC or ABC, I can't remember what it was at the time, you know, ex warning. And the night before, I mean, we were literally still counting pennies, and people were driving in from all over the country with contributions that people had given us and so on, so that we could put Mr. LaRouche on national television. Now, I managed to find a very grainy video of that. Unfortunately, it does not have the opening image, which I will describe to you. The opening image was a thermonuclear mushroom crowd, cloud with Jimmy Carter's grin coming out of it. So that's how it started. Um, I'm going to show you just a few excerpts, but this was, in a sense, his first intervention to try and save the presidency from the British. That's what these people are committed to. I've given it to you in brief, but what I've said to you is the essential thinking of heads of European governments, heads of European parties, heads of uh, parties and other forces in this country who are rightly convinced that if Carter were to be elected with this combination of advisors, uh, Zumwalt, Nitze, Schlesinger, Rostow, men with long-standing records generally as maniacs for war, that Ca with Carter their boy, Jimmy boy, the Jimmy boy of the New York Council on Foreign Relations, that this nation would be headed to war. Now, the personality of Carter, of course, is 
somewhat minor in this respect. Carter is nothing but a pawn of the Rockefeller-dominated forces together with some other forces, i.e. the New York Council on Foreign Relations. Carter was a protege of David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski in the uh, Trilateral Commission organized by David Rockefeller. He's nothing but a Rockefeller pawn. However, his personality is significant. We've seen how Gerald Ford, a man of known limitations, has attempted to grow into the job of president. He's tried to grow into the White House. And Gerald Ford has, on a number of times, to my knowledge, acted to prevent the United States from moving toward a collision course with the nuclear war. There's no question that Gerald Ford is a man who, by intention and some degree of understanding, is committed to peace, particularly if he has the right advisors. But Carter is not the kind of man who would grow into the White House. I just wanted you to see that. But imagine, this was national television, you know, warning people what Jimmy Carter, that Jimmy Carter was born of the Trilateral Commission and David Rockefeller, and that his policies would lead us to thermonuclear confrontation. Um, this broadcast brought Mr. LaRouche to the attention of patriotic layers within our military, within our intelligence community, who were fighting against these utopian madmen. And they said, here is a man who knows what he is, talk what he is talking about. And reached out and resulted in a dialogue between Mr. LaRouche and many of these layers, which went on for decades and decades and decades. We also testified against all of Carter's cabinet nominees um, uh, in the United States Senate, um, because they were all members of the Trilateral Commission. And as I think I've told some people in the past, when I finally, I was in Washington, and when I finally got to the last nominee, who was Cyrus Vance, the nominee for Secretary of State, and I was testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, the chairman, John Sparkman, said, uh, Mrs. Kokendo, could we just cut to the chase? Is he or is he not a member of the Trilateral Commission? <laughs> because they knew what we had done to every single one of these cabinet nominees. Now, Mr. LaRouche himself announced early that he, too, was going to run for president in 1980. The first time he had run, we tried a third party. They don't work. The second time, he ran in the Democratic Party, number one, to challenge the likes of the Jimmy Carters of the Democratic Party, but much more importantly, to revive the tradition of John Kennedy and Franklin Roosevelt. In fact, he was explicitly invited in by old FDR and JFK type Democrats saying, please, we need to save this outlook in the Democratic Party. And while he was campaigning in New Hampshire in the primaries, he had the opportunity to be on the same podium a number of times with uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, and the two of them shared their concern about this danger of thermonuclear war being brought about by these utopians who thought you could play chicken with mankind. Obviously, our, our existing doctrine at the time was mutual and assured destruction, MAD, which had essentially been devised by Henry Kissinger as a British agent of influence to keep the world at loggerheads, never rising to the level of actual thermonuclear war that keep people pitted against each other. But as LaRouche and Reagan and Donald Trump, who in the same period of time apparently was expressing, I don't know if it was in writing or otherwise, his concern about the danger of nuclear war. In fact, he, he reports sometime in the past that he had an uncle who was a nuclear physicist whom he had long discussions with. And at one point, Trump wrote a letter to the president whoever the head of Russia, Soviet Union was at the time, saying, look, I'd like to be a negotiator, you know, a back channel so that we can talk and we can end this threat of thermonuclear war. This is something that the same people understood. Um, and so as a result of this history, we were putting himself forward with this TV show, the contacts we developed in the military and, military and intelligence layers, patriotic layers, uh, his contact with Reagan and so on, he was brought in and uh, was an uh, advisor to Reagan's transition team. I was in Washington, D.C. at the time, and he would come in on a regular basis during the transition period to meet with people in the Reagan transition team on two critical questions. 
Number one, and this is what he had been discussing with Reagan, the fact that we had new scientific capabilities, lasers, particle beams, other kinds of directed energy weapons, which could knock down ICBMs and threat and end the threat of thermonuclear war, of ICBM delivered thermonuclear war. This was something that, that was being very seriously um, discussed in these layers. And the second was freeing the U.S. economy from Wall Street, the Federal Reserve, and the City of London, because we had just experienced Paul Volcker's 20% interest rates, which destroyed our farmers, destroyed our small businessmen, destroyed our manufacturing, destroyed anything that was productive. You can't be engaged in productive activity with 20% interest rates. You can if you're a speculator, and that's who it benefited. So LaRouche was also in discussion with Reagan's economic team to free the United States from this grip. Uh, and there's a longer backstory to that, which um, goes back to Nixon taking the dollar off the gold reserve standard in 1971, which was the first step in turning our economy over to the bankers. We can get into that more later if people have questions about that. Um, so as a result of these discussions, well, there was a bit of an interregnum. Uh, because people may remember less than 60 days being into office, Ronald Reagan was shot uh, and almost killed, um, recovered. But during the period of his recovery, and I think it obviously did affect him, it allowed the Bush crowd to consolidate their control over much of his administration. And much of what Reagan did in the rest of that term and his second term is, in a sense, an almost attenuated version of what you see Donald Trump doing today. That is, Trump is acting on his own as president. Reagan did it the best he could under those circumstances. And the most important thing that he did was his famous announcement on March 23, 1983, of the Strategic Defense Initiative. LaRouche's proposal to use these advanced physical principles to, as President Reagan said in his famous speech, render thermonuclear ICBMs impotent and obsolete. Now, Mr. LaRouche had another, there was another aspect to this question of the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is that you are unleashing new physical principles. And this is the key to advancing your economy. Bill is going to go into this in much greater detail, that you can't just stand in the same place. You constantly have to be animating your economy <coughs> by moving it forward. And um, the, Mr. LaRouche took these ideas then into his own 1984 campaign. And again, from the standpoint of defending the presidency, of making clear to the American population what are the principles which have to animate the presidency of the United States. And he wanted to make sure that Walter Mondale did not get elected. One of his TV shows in 1984 was Walter Mondale, Soviet agent. No, why, why Moscow fears LaRouche and loves Walter Mondale, or something like that. Um, but I think the most famous TV broadcast that he ever did, and I think it captures this question of the defense of the presidents, is a broadcast he did in 1980, uh, 1984. Uh, called Henry Kissinger, Soviet agent of influence. It's ironic because he really shows that he's a British agent of influence. Um, it's not on YouTube, I looked, but I happened years ago to have a VHS copy of this TV show, and I saved it and I put it on a DVD. Um, and, I want to, and I want to show you the last, pretty much half of this show, because I think more than anything, it if you think about what LaRouche does in this show, the absolutely no holds barred approach that he takes to Kissinger, to the enemies of mankind, and so on, I think you can see the link that I'm making in this arc of time to Donald Trump today. LaRouche kept alive.
something in the United States when nobody else would fight in this way. Kissinger and his liberal establishment masters and accomplices have worked consistently for approximately 25 years to aid the Soviet Empire's achievement of the New Yalta Agreement worked out between Khrushchev and the circles of the evil Bertrand Russell. This is the reason that the world is near the brink of thermonuclear war today. Through the work of such people as McGeorge Bundy, Robert S. McNamara, Averill Harriman, and Henry Kissinger, the Soviet Empire has been enabled to develop the strategic capabilities to challenge directly the most vital interests of the United States. But for the sabotage of the interests and national defense of the United States, by aid of such influential circles and persons, there would be no danger of an actual thermonuclear war today. To understand fully the policies of Kissinger and his kind, we must look at a second feature of the policies of such evil men as Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, and the cult leader, Alastair Crowley. Three men who did more to destroy the United States from within with the help of the late Robert M. Hutchins than perhaps anyone else. To understand the motives behind Russell's new Yalta proposal to Khrushchev, one must know the bare facts about Russell's long-term utopian policies. I read you two brief excerpts now from the writings of Bertrand Russell. The first of these is a passage from a book Russell wrote back in 1923, entitled The Prospects of Industrial Civilization. See if you recognize this policy as being that of an ecologist political faction in the United States and Europe today. The white population of the world will soon cease to increase. The Asiatic races will be longer, and the Negroes still longer before their birth rate falls sufficiently to make their numbers stable without the help of war and pestilence. Until that happens, the benefits aimed at by socialism can only be partially realized, and the less prolific races will have to defend themselves by methods which are disgusting, even if they are necessary. After the war, in 1951, the same satanic Russell wrote in a book named The Impact of Science on Society. At present, the population of the world is increasing at about 58,000 per diem. War, so far, has had no great effect on this increase, which continued through each of the world wars. War has hitherto been disappointing in this respect, but perhaps bacteriological war may prove more effective. If a black death could spread through the world once in every generation, Survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. The state of affairs might be somewhat unpleasant, but what of it? The essence of Bertrand Russell's purpose for the entire extent of his satanic adult life was the destruction of modern civilization and the creation of a miserable condition of feudalistic society to be ruled by the Anglo-Saxon race. Russell intended this to be a form of utopia which was to be established by massive genocide against the darker-skinned populations of the world, including such sections of humanity as those of Arab, Turkish, Greek, Italian, and Spanish ethnic origins. Russell's proposal for a scheme of world government and his back-channel New York agreements with Moscow were for Russell, for H.G. Wells, and for their co-thinkers of the liberal establishments a way of bringing Russell's design for a feudalist Anglo-Saxon world empire into being. Russell found among the hardened racialists within the ruling caste of the Russian Soviet dictatorship a partner who had similar, if conflicting, goals to match Russell's own. Russell and such a vowed feudalist as Henry Kissinger allied with the Soviet dictatorship not because they like Russia, but because they hate what the United States represents. The most crucial point is this. To be able to sell the doctrine of post-industrial society to the fellows in our Pentagon and Congress, Russell and his crowd had to convince those military and political leaders that a technologically progressive development of the agro-industrial base of the national economy was no longer strategically essential. This selling job 
was done by insisting that war fighting would come to a halt at the time the thermonuclear intercontinental barrages were completed. Therefore, the argument went, there is no need for the military forces of the depth which might be used to continue war fighting after that stage of the war, after the initial thermonuclear bombardment. In other words, under conditions of general thermonuclear war between the superpowers, there would not be enough left alive, they argued, after the opening salvos to continue war. Therefore, the argument went, conventional military capabilities have no strategic significance for fighting a general war. Therefore, the spokesman for turning the United States into a post-industrial junk heap argued, technologically progressive investment in agriculture and in industry is no longer important for national defense. Something more cruel, more criminal was added. Neo-Malthusian programs of genocide against the populations of the so-called developing nations. It happens the cheapest and easiest way to commit genocide is by famine and epidemic under slave labor conditions, as the Nazis showed at Auschwitz. Therefore, until the 1960s, even those among our military, for example, who might share the Anglo-Saxon racism of an Averill Harriman, would have defended the well-being of Latin American nations on elementary grounds of US strategic logistical interests. With the introduction of flexible response, this changed. Like the Nazi regime during World War II, the world's most powerful international and financial agencies today have targeted between 120 and 150 millions black Africans for death through genocide, death by famine and epidemic. This mass murder is the policy of influential institutions, such as the Club of Rome, which claims that regions such as black Africa are overpopulated, and the world's population must be reduced by such methods. The evil policies of the Club of Rome are being implemented by powerful banking institutions of Switzerland, by the International Monetary Fund, by the World Bank. These are policies endorsed by high officials of our own Federal Reserve System. These are policies being put into effect in many parts of the world by Henry A. Kissinger and his friends. This monstrous immorality, practiced abroad, comes home to us today. In such forms is a growing movement for genocide against our own nation's most vulnerable citizens, the seriously ill and our senior citizens. The same crime for which we condemned Nazi doctors at the Nuremberg trials the crime of new euthanasia is being promoted in the United States and in Western Europe today as death with dignity. This growing murder of our seriously ill and senior citizens is being promoted by persons and groups who argue that such systematic murder of tens of thousands and more of our citizens is needed to keep down the average cost of health insurance premiums or to help balance the Social Security budgets. Senator Harrison Williams was not murdered by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but his case is an example of that same immorality in government we see more vividly in the form of genocide against black Africa and in the form of Nazi-like policies of euthanasia against our invalids and against our senior citizens. According to the evidence presented by the U.S. Department of Justice in federal court, Senator Williams not only refused any offer of a bribe, but was in the process of lecturing what he believed to be an Arab guest in our country, that in our country such practices are not tolerated. No, no, no. Yet the senator was convicted. An innocent U.S. senator sent to prison on the instruction of a federal judge he was convicted and sentenced on the grounds that he looked like a public official who might have taken a bribe at some other time. In the city of New York, for example, one of the best ways to keep out of prison 
is to be arrested for murder. And one of the easiest ways to commit crime without fear of arrest is to peddle drugs openly at major intersections. The city's government has ordered the police not to interfere with drug peddling of this sort. However, commit no offense, but be falsely charged by some FBI frame-up or some frame-up of the office of the District Attorney of Manhattan, and you will almost certainly be railroaded to prison. While the murderer, apprehended on the same date, walks the streets to kill again, virtually scot-free. So it must appear that a judgment like that, fallen upon biblical Sodom and Gomorrah, looms above the flesh pots of our morally sick nation. We can escape this threatened doom if we as a people awaken in time. We must recognize where we made the wrong turn in morality and in government policy making during the post-war period. We must reverse that error and do it quickly. Time is running out. I also proposed that this new strategic doctrine which the president announced on March 23rd, 1983, would be a way of destroying the rotten agreement which Bertrand Russell and others made with Moscow back during the 1950s. The rotten agreement which Henry Kissinger and others have been defending in their function as Soviet agents of influence. I did this for many reasons, but of all, I did it to eradicate Russell's and Kissinger's policies of Malthusian genocide by destroying the roots of Kissinger's feudalistic neo-colonialism, roots embedded in the nuclear deterrence doctrine. It is now approximately 17 years since April 1967, the day back then when Pope Paul VI issued his appeal for an end to the evil genocide, today being practiced by Henry Kissinger's and the fellow travelers of the Club of Rome. Although Pope Paul VI encyclical Populorum Progressio is a Catholic doctrine, it expresses and reflects the very essence of the natural law of Judeo-Christian Western civilization. The essence of natural law is that every human life is sacred and that the development of the creative mental potentialities of each and all individuals is also the sacred duty of society and that also society must afford to each and all persons the opportunity to employ the developed potentialities in some way which contributes good to present and future generations. That no man is compelled to go to his grave like a mere beast. This is the law of equity. That law of equity is an absolute in the sense that no state and no man can deny any individual, anywhere, his right to equity so defined, unless that violation be to defend the very existence of those institutions of society on which the fostering and protection of equity for all persons depends. Unfortunately, neither the Russian Empire nor feudalists such as Henry A. Kissinger and his accomplices accept these doctrines of natural law. In his notorious doctoral dissertation back at Harvard University, Kissinger pledged his future diplomatic career to follow in the example of the Holy Alliance's Prince Metternich. Kissinger pledged himself to the heritage of the Persian, Roman, Byzantine, Ottoman, and Austro-Hungarian and Russian empires. He rejects absolutely in his practice and belief the Judeo-Christian natural law of Western civilization. And he adheres to that evil misconception of man and the universe typified by the slave society of ancient Sparta and typified by the sodomy-ridden abomination, which was the empire of Rome. In its own fashion, today's rulers of the Russian Empire also trace their philosophical heritage from Lycurgus's Sparta and from the models of empire in which one master race rules as overlord over subjugated races. The injustice we tolerate against the peoples of black Africa were targeted by the genocidal financial and economic policies of Kissinger and his feudalistic friends is an act of injustice which savagely violates our own most fundamental moral values. The injustice which our government 
and major political figures tolerate throughout our nation, as they tolerate the FBI's Gestapo-like frame-up against an innocent U.S. senator, and tolerate murder and drug pushing in cities like New York City. These are but an echo of the fact that it is our morality itself which has been shattered by tolerating Henry A. Kissinger and his accomplices in foreign policy. Let us go back to being a great industrial power, an agro-industrial power flourishing in scientific and technological progress. Let us be again what was said of us at the establishment of our independence from the feudalistic policies of Britain, a temple of liberty and a beacon of hope for all mankind. Let us again be the defender of the smaller, weaker nations of the world against colonialism and imperialism in all their manifestations. Let us build among the sovereign nation states a community of principle according to natural law, as Pope Paul VI, Popolorum Progressio, beseeches us to do. Let the President of the United States be a person who knows that his or her most essential duty is that of the chief magistrate of a great republic. Let the frightened and oppressed of our own and other nations around the earth look up with just hope from their injured circumstances and say to themselves, this is an injustice which the President of the United States would not tolerate if he knew of it. Let that opinion be justified. Therefore, let us proceed to expend the needed $200 billion estimated to be required to emplace a first-generation ballistic de missile defense for this nation by the year 1988. That will be not only a physical defense of our republic, but will represent an act by aid of which we return to the principles upon which this republic was founded. Let us move Henry A. Kissinger and what he represents for once and forever out of the policy-making processes of government. All right. Is it going to surprise anybody that there was already a Get Rouge task force in place and that several years later the first indictments came down thanks to Robert Mueller and William Weld, the president's current enemies? And that brief reference to what had happened to Senator Harrison Williams at the hands of the FBI. It was about to happen to the Rouge, and then 30 years later it happened to Donald Trump. But this was the fight, this is the fight, that Linda LaRouche kept alive throughout this entire period. Um, but it wasn't always, I mean, as you can see from this, this excerpt, it was on one hand making clear to people the evil of the enemy. On the other hand, it was inspiring people to remember what it is that makes us human. And I think the second most famous TV broadcast he did, this one was 1984. And I can say in 1984, back when you could buy a half hour of TV time for $150,000 or $200,000, we had him on TV over 10 times. I mean, people used to think that it was a regular show after the 11 o'clock news or something. I mean, a lot of the times it was lighter because it was a little bit cheaper. But millions and millions and millions of Americans saw these shows. We had hundreds of chapters throughout the United States, and it's time for us to revive that, which will be part of our implementation discussion at the end. We had hundreds of candidates, some of whom were, some of whom are in this room. Dan ran for city council in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, back what year was that? 84, 84, 85. Um, some began to win Democratic primary elections, which completely freaked the enemy out. Um, and, but as I say, to, to inspire people of what this nation could once, could again be. I'm going to show you another very, very brief excerpt now from a 1988 broadcast. Now, LaRouche was already, had already been indicted once by Robert Mueller. He was about to be indicted again in federal court later in 1988, and that's the one that ultimately sent him to jail. But he was running for president. And he did a broadcast, which I think is um, extraordinary 
given what our own president announced just two weeks ago, that we are reviving our manned space program, that we will have Americans on the moon by 2024 in American rockets. And I'm going to show the Vice President's uh, announcement of that in a few minutes. But this, again, is an idea plant kept alive by LaRouche and by the LaRouche movement. So I'm going to just show you the end of a broadcast that he did called The Woman on Mars. Um, it begins it begins and ends with a uh, representation of a woman uh, from our first colony on Mars announcing that the colony is up and running. I'm, I'm not going to show it at the beginning, but you'll hear it again at the end. Uh, with the proposed, with the idea that this would happen 39 years from the date of this, which would have made it 2028. We can assure every one of you that your children and grandchildren have the opportunity for a bright future. That, in my opinion, is the true mission of government. Lyndon LaRouche sums up his report by describing the way in which the Mars Mission Project will spill new technologies and entirely new industries into an expanding job market. As president, I shall call together the representatives of industries, including the automotive and aerospace sector. I shall say to them, ladies and gentlemen, I need your cooperation to give the United States the world's most advanced tool industry. I shall wrestle with the Congress to provide such legislation as we need for you to do your job properly. We are going to get the last disgusting vestige of decay, pollution, and poverty out of this nation's life. And you are going to play a key part in bringing this about. It will work like this. First, as I told you in my broadcast several weeks ago, we are going to pour about $2 trillion a year of low-cost credit into infrastructure and industrial expansion. Second, we're going to have an emergency tax reform which stimulates investment with investment tax credit incentives. Third, the research and development of the project will be tightly interfaced with the growth of our modernized tool sector. This means that the tool sector will have the new technologies available as rapidly as they're developed. It means that industry can obtain uses of these technologies as rapidly as they are developed. With ample low-cost credit for investments in new technologies, plus investment tax credit incentives, our national economy will achieve the highest rate of technological growth in history. This will require sweeping improvements in public school education. It requires more classics and science in the schools. It will require National Science Foundation scholarships and merit pay increases for teachers. And will require National Science Foundation assistance to local schools in providing the exhibits and other teaching materials needed to introduce students to the new space age technologies. This requires a shift away from present trends in business education to produce more managers qualified in production technologies. It means a much better way to live than the drab misery, illiteracy, and decay into which our nation has been drifting the past 20 years. Then, 39 years from now, we shall hear the broadcast from Mars announcing that the first permanent colony there is operational. Among those colonists will be some of the children and grandchildren of you watching this broadcast tonight. Many of you will be watching that first television broadcast from that new colony. Already, the woman who will speak to you then from Mars has just recently been born somewhere in the United States. We shall give our nation once again that great future which our children and grandchildren deserve.
is a question of giving this back to the American people. And the potential now, because of Trump's successful defeat of this coup against him, is just, the window is just now beginning to open again. Um, I'm going to conclude with, um, with what that potential looks like. But first to say that Mr. LaRouche himself, when he was asked in the course of the judicial attacks on him, his jailing, and so on, he was asked by his legal team, what would you say is the one reason they went after you? I and mean, you can think of a lot of reasons. I mean, he took on Henry Kissinger, he took on the British Empire, he took on the international bankers, and so on. Uh, he said, it's because if the strategic defense initiative, as I had envisioned it, had been implemented by Reagan, we would have unleashed new physical principles in the economy and we would have transformed our economy, and we would have transformed our people. And that really is the mission. So, um, and as I say, we now the door is just cracked open again to this potential. I'm going to show you uh, first one minute of Vice President Pence. I have to say, I am not a big fan of Vice President Pence, but in this case, he's channeling the president. So he's doing something useful. And then I'm going to show a few minutes of the NASA administrator himself talking about where we stand in this great endeavor. Just as the United States was the first nation to reach the moon in the 20th century, so too will we be the first nation to return astronauts to the moon in the 21st century. And I'm here on the president's behalf to tell the men and women of the Marshall Space Flight Center and the American people that at the direction of the president of the United States, it is the stated policy of this administration and the United States of America to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. And let me be clear, the first woman and the next man on the moon will both be American astronauts launched by American rockets from American soil. The President has directed NASA and Administrator Jim Bridenstine to accomplish this goal by any means necessary. In order to succeed, we must focus on the mission over the means. You must consider every available option and platform to meet our goals, including industry, government, and the entire American space enterprise. History is written by those who dare to dream big and do the impossible. You have given us a charge today. <laughs> NOAA understands. Uh, the Commerce Department understands. They're calling us. So we, we've got to figure out um, how we're going to continue the missions that we've been tasked to accomplish under this kind of new environment. And I, I don't know at this point. I'm going to be honest. We've got to figure it out. But it's a big deal, and it's important, and we're going to continue working on it. The key is, Steve, to your point, what are we doing about it? Dialogue. We need to communicate with all parts of the federal government about why this is a challenge and figure out how we're going to deal with it because it's, it's going to have a big impact. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. We're looking at the questions on NASA.gov backslash town hall, and we're seeing a theme, so we're going to combine some. Um, Vice President Mike Pence said, um, NASA must transform itself into a leaner, more accountable, and more agile organization. He also said, if NASA is not currently capable of landing American astronauts on the moon in five years, we need to change the organization, not the mission. What does this mean? Do you think NASA will meet the 2024 deadline? And how specifically can NASA be reformed to meet these ambitious goals? The answer is, do I believe it's gonna, we're going to meet the deadline? Absolutely. And that, 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 that's a point of emphasis, because um, here you have an administration that declared we were going to land humans on the surface of the moon during the time which that administration might potentially still be in office. That's a very serious declaration. Even if you go back 
to John F. Kennedy's day, uh, he said within, by the end of the decade, which guaranteed he would not be in office uh, by the end of the decade. That's a 10-year horizon. So this is, a, this, is, this is a very serious proposal to make it happen and to get it done. I hear the comment all the time about Lucy and the football. Lucy and the football. I, I've heard it since I've been here probably, I don't know, a couple of hundred times. This is not Lucy and the football. In the executive branch, people are very serious. We're going to the moon, and we're going fast, and we're going with international and commercial partners, with international and commercial partners. So I, I don't want to discount how important that question is. Do I believe it's possible? Absolutely. Why? Because you're here. You're the ones that are going to make it possible. You're the ones that are going to... This is a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I hope everybody here takes that away. This, this is an opportunity for people in this room and people watching from across the agency to say where you were when you're talking to your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. This opportunity before us is something we haven't had in a very long time, saying we're going to go to the moon and we're going to know within five years. It's never, it's, it's never happened before, but now it has happened. So, yes, we're going to do it. The vice president is correct. If we have to reorganize, we're going to reorganize. And a lot of people are familiar with the new Moon to Mars Mission Directorate, and that is a part of this initiative, which is, you know, when we talk about operations and we talk about development, those are two very different kind of capabilities. And I don't ever want to say that space flight is somehow normal. Notice he said Moon to Mars. So this is not just the Moon, this is Mars. So yeah. the door is open. Um, and that, th this, this again, this is what the question of the exoneration of the roof is. It is an understanding by the American people of what the fight, what the principles of the American Republic are, what the American presidency represents, and what it has taken to actually defend that over these years, and to now bring it into full flower with this president in an international environment. And you notice the NASA administrator said international cooperation. And yes, it probably, we will probably, we will be, as far as I know, the next human beings on the moon, but China has a rover on the far side of the moon right now. And we use Russian rockets to get to the International Space Station. This is the kind of international cooperation which does address the common aims of mankind. I, I don't know if people have paid attention. In the past couple of months, there's been a couple of little asteroids exploding you know, in the atmosphere. Not with deadly force, like we saw with Chelyabinsk a few years ago, but near misses and so on. LaRouche's Strategic Defense Initiative is the pathway by which you not only defend a nation from ICBMs, and hopefully under a new regime not run by the British, but run by sovereign nations that will cease to be a danger. But the danger that exists out there is asteroids, it's comets. We look at the time we lost. 1988, LaRouche projected a colony on Mars by 2028. We're not going to quite make that. But now we are talking about a base, a landing on the moon, a permanent base on the moon, and the potential to finally catch up for lost time. So that's what I wanted to present. I wanted to invite Bill to come up um, and address this now more deeply from the standpoint of the really unique contribution which Mr. LaRouche has made uh, to the question of physical economics, which is at the heart of this. Uh, this is very, very exciting. And what I think I'd like to do is contribute a little bit or supplement this question that Susan developed of the institution of the presidency and why this is so unique and why the way in which Trump is doing this now that his presidency is free of this coup process, why it is that this mission that he's committed us to for con really continuing the process that we left off with the assassination of, of Kennedy, of continuing this, this process of continuous scientific progress for mankind. Because <clears throat> if you 
think about think about the document, the the Declaration of the Independence of the United States. Um, uh, so the idea, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, it doesn't say in order to in order to form the most perfect union. And arguably, when the United States was created, it was the most perfect union, I would say, of, of, a, of a bringing together a vast people over across a geographically large area <clears throat> into a unified system of government um, of the people by, by the people and for the people, you could very much argue that that was the most perfect union that existed. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, we the people of the United States, in order to create uh, a perfect union or the perfect union. So um, maybe, maybe this idea of perfection uh, is more of a verb than a noun. Just to consider. I'm not going to state that definitively, but but consider the concept of perfection as a verb, the uh, perfection process. So there it is, right in, right in the Declaration of Independence. If space aliens were to land on Earth and look at and say, well, what's, what's, the, what's the greatest nation on Earth? OK, what, how did this country get created? And they would look at the Declaration of Independence and say, we the people of the United States, in order to create a more perfect union, and somehow they understand English. They say, <laughs> okay, um, let's, okay, what's going on with this country? And they look at the state of the country, and there is very little emphasis or, or um, <clears throat> very, little, um, very little commitment in, re in the recent 40, 50 years to uh, really what you might consider to actually be the the necessary process, the necessary process for um, for perfection, and um, they would probably conclude that you know, and they might look at other parts of the world and see actually a greater commitment to um, technological progress. Um, my cousin's wife is from. Bolivia. Okay, Bolivia has gone from a country, I mean, their president was literally the head of a party that represented uh, co uh, cocaine farmers. Um, now, that doesn't define him as an individual, but the country came out of the process of being uh, a fairly backwards country in which cocaine, the farming of cocaine was, you know, a significant uh, sort of political force, and today this country is developing a space program. Anyway, there's many, many examples of countries like Ethiopia that have that have really gone through a very different direction of uh, of perfecting some perfecting themselves. So anyway, I was telling a story about space aliens, and um, <laughs> if space aliens landed on Earth and read our Constitution and looked at the condition of the United States, they would really, and, and, and maybe got some glimmers of history of how this conception of um, uh, more perfect union was you know, put into effect, you know, certain things that were developed. But they'd have to conclude that the last 50 years it had to have been somehow the product of some very powerful um, force committed to uh, sort of ridding our country of this <clears throat> of this concept of uh, of a certain kind of science driven continuous science driven technological progress. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, suffice it to say, <clears throat> um, I we, we we heard some quotes from Bertrand Russell, <clears throat> and um, Bertrand Russell was the center of a British intelligence operation, which was which was aimed at polluting a British intelligence operation that was really aimed at polluting uh, the scientific fields, particularly quantum uh, physics, the Copenhagen School. Um, and anyone who does a real competent study of 20th century science can <clears throat> understand that Bertrand Russell, this, this agent of the British Empire, um, was uh, working to uh, discredit science in itself and discredit the, this very notion in the Declaration of Independence that the whole purpose of a nation is to foster a continuous process of the perfection of the union of, of peoples. Now, obviously the frame of reference that is being activated within people right now with President Trump's recommitment to a manned space program is President Kennedy. <coughs> um, and while Kennedy's moon mission is, in a certain sense, a unprecedented example in American history of the ability to <clears throat> use the institution of the presidency to transform the nation, transform mankind, um, <clears throat> challenge Americans to um, commit to improving their minds, <clears throat> um, challenge Americans to adopt a different idea of the future that they're going to work toward. It's not. It's not completely the only example within American history of this happening. Um, and the example I'm going to take a look at real quick as a snapshot to supplement today's discussion on the real power and uh, <clears throat> unique institution of the American presidency is Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> And I think, uh, I'm going to read a lot of quotes, but I think people will be able to follow, I'll put them up. Um, because um, I think in order to truly appreciate the kind of power that <clears throat> this commitment to what is being done with NASA how this resonates in the American population, um, and really the power of this, you have to. I think I think we have to understand <clears throat> something about the institution of the United States presidency as a unique institution. Um, and. Um, and actually, the, the reflex to, by the American people to a kind of, um, that, th that this resonance in the American population has to do with something that's in our cultural DNA because of the uniqueness of the institution of the presidency. But not only that, the, what's happening with what President Trump is doing in part is a reflection back into the United States of the long-term long historical arc and effect of the United States presidency throughout the world. When President Trump is able to meet with leaders who perhaps in a certain way embody this longer-term historical arc even more than he does, this process is actually reflected back in the United States. And I'll cite something that will give perhaps some context to that statement. Um, does anyone here know 
when the first time, when was the first time that the former colonial nations of Asia and Africa um, collectively declared independence from their formal, <coughs> former colonial masters? Not just a formal independence, but an actual independence in, in fact, economically and otherwise. The first one was English born. Haiti was the first one. Oh, not an individual country. I'm saying a collection of countries, a large collection of countries, countries throughout the world coming together. First, South America. What year? South America, late 1980s. 1980s? Oh, well, I said no. Well, actually, actually, in Venezuela, we came free in 1823. Okay, in the Western Hemisphere, that's that's true. It was earlier, but in terms of Asia and Africa, in terms of nations that well, represent, the, 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 Faz said the non-aligned movement. The, the, the colonization process were early 60s. Yeah, 1955 was the Bandung Conference. This was in Indonesia. It was convened by Sukarno, the leader of Indonesia. And consciously, he, he modeled this conference on the idea of the American Declaration of Independence. Um, this was... Uh, well, has been a model that has been used for a yeah, for, yeah, it's for, for a long time. But this... this, this um, you know, this, this conference brought together China, um, many of the nations of, of Asia and Africa. So I just wanted to cite that um, because, I mean, if you're Chinese, for example, if you're part of the Chinese government, the idea of 100 years of history, that's recent history. In the Chinese cultural memory, 100 years is, is, is like yeah. very recent history. They have a, they have a culture of 5,000 5, years. 5,000 years, yeah. yeah. And Americans, I have to point this out to Americans a lot of times, he said, do you realize that the first president, uh, the, the founder of the modern nation state of China was a Christian? And he said, they, most Americans have no idea when China was founded as a country. Um, yeah, he was a Christian, so that time he was a Christian. And this was sometime Slightly over 100 years ago. Go, oh, 100 years ago. But 100 years ago is like, is like nothing. Yeah, well, so, the China is 5,000 years ago. Yeah, China is 5,000 years ago. So, um, <clears throat> does anyone know who created, which president created the Department of Agriculture? Agriculture. I'll give you, I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. It was probably one of the last presidencies in which more than half the population were still farmers. Franklin Roosevelt. Who created the Department of Agriculture? Which president? Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We got a historian here. Um, yeah, it was Abraham Lincoln. And um, Lincoln, he, uh, he knew that if he was going to launch a, a process of bringing the population, um, making the population better, making the population more committed to science, there was no larger group of people in the country than the farmers. Um, but in all of his years as a, pub as a public speaker, and he gave many, many speeches, he only ever devoted one speech entirely to the subject of agriculture. And it was in 1859, less than two years before he became president, and it was delivered to the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society. And um, so it was like a, it was a um, agricultural fair. And these things were set up so that Farmers would come from across the state. The state farms are not, shows are not really like this anymore. It's kind of unfortunate. But it was more of a, um, it was a, uh, it was a way to present ideas and inventions so that people could learn from one another and you could disseminate knowledge among people. Um, 
So Lincoln was selected as the person to give the, as like the public figure to give the address at this state fair. And um, he says, look, you know, I, I'm probably going to be expected to flatter all of you because, and that's probably why you choose politicians because you know that they're going to come and say great things about farmers because farmers are the biggest voting bloc. And he's, he basically says, um, you know, I don't know if I'm ex that's expected of me, but um, <clears throat> I'll just say that my opinion of farmers is that in proportion to their numbers, they're neither better nor worse than any other people. So he doesn't, he doesn't romanticize the farmer in some sort of pseudo-patriotic way um, as, you know, the salt of the earth or anything like that. Um, what he does instead is he emphasizes the joy of discovery and how fortunate the educated man is who works in agriculture because, um, because the opportunities at, at discoveries um, are numerous and um, it, it, it will make the, the person in this area more productive. And he goes directly into a discussion of the economics of agriculture. Um, how do we increase the yield of crop per acre of land? How do we diminish the total proportion of energy that's uh, wasted that doesn't go directly into the, the output? Um, he discusses how perhaps steam-powered plows can be adopted for increasing the productivity of farms. And he discusses what it's going to look like to increase the productivity of the soil up to the maximum amount, what that would do. And he discusses the difficulties that would be associated with trying to mechanize um, the productive process by the introduction of machines, with the various problems associated with that, how it might be overcome. <clears throat> then he turns to the question of... Uh, well, he did, yeah, he, he might discuss that somewhere, but... Um, the thorough cultivation, actually he does get into this, he actually does discuss the question of how by decreasing the amount of land um, that is necessary to cultivate for a given crop, that that's, that's the only way to, for this process to be consistent with um, a peaceful tendency in, in, in the world. So he says, then he discusses the idea of thorough cultivation, and let me put this up. Okay, so this is, um, <clears throat> this is what Lincoln says about uh, the farmer, what he calls thorough cultivation, um, or the farmer maximizing his productivity. It says, the effect through cultivation upon the farmer's own mind, and in reaction through his mind, back upon his business is perhaps quite equal to any other of its effects. Every man is proud of what he does well, and no man is proud of what he does not do well. With the farmer, his heart is in his work. Oh, with the former, his heart is in his work. And he will do twice as much of it with less fatigue. The latter, the one who does not do his work well, uh, performs a little imperfectly, and imagines himself exceedingly tired, the little he has done comes to nothing for want of finishing. So we've all experienced this. <laughs> if you're not doing something well, you imagine yourself completely tired of it, you give up before you're finished, and you know it doesn't like motivate you at all, because you know what you're doing is not very effective. But when you're effective, you're going to want to be, you're going to want to move on to other things and, and be effective in that as well. So, um, <clears throat> so this is, so now, then he discussed, then he brings his, um, his discussion to that of how the, the workforce of the future is not going to be this situation where the vast majority of people are uneducated performing manual labor and then you have a small percentage of the population that does no labor and is educated. 
but rather um, you're going to have an increase in the proportion of the population who is free labor and they'll be educated. Um, and uh, here's what he's Um, yeah, already you have much of the population is being educated, so if all the educated people didn't work, it would be a problem because there wouldn't be that many people left to work. So he says the challenge, then, then the question of the economy of the future, he says, is what is the best way to combine education and labor? <clears throat> We're not going to have this great separation between the educated class and the laboring class. So we have to really think of how we educate our workforce so that we are educating them in areas that make the labor most useful. And what he says is, um, says, this leads to further reflection <clears throat> that no other human occupation opens so wide a field for the profitable and agreeable combination of labor with cultivated thought as agriculture. I know of nothing so pleasant to the mind as the discovery of anything which is once new and valuable, nothing which so lightens and sweetens toil as the hopeful pursuit of such discovery. And how vast and how varied a field is agriculture for such discovery. The mind is already trained to thought in the country school or higher school. The mind already trained to, to, to thought in, in the country school or higher school cannot fail to find there an exhaustless source of profitable enjoyment. Every blade of grass is a study, and to produce two where there was but one is both a profit and a pleasure. And not grass alone, but soils, seeds, and seasons, hedges, ditches, and fences, draining, droughts, and irrigation, plowing, hoeing, and harrowing, reaping, mowing, threshing, saving crops, pests of crops, diseases of crops, and what will prevent or cure them, implements, utensils, and machines, their relative merits, and how to improve them, Hogs, horses, and cattle, sheep, goats, and poultry, trees, shrubs, fruits, plants, and flowers, the thousands of things of which these are specimens, each a world of study itself. Then he goes on to discuss chemistry, botany, and mechanical engineering. So this was the seed crystal for the idea. <clears throat> one of the main one of the main policies of his administration was the creation of the land grant colleges which were set up as institutions to train farmers and mechanical engineers exactly in this sort of way, right? To create the economy, to create a scientific farming class. Then he turns back to the concept of thorough, thorough work or thorough cultivation. He says, and thorough work again renders sufficient the smallest quantity of ground to each man. And this again conforms to what must occur in a world less inclined to war and more devoted to the arts of peace than heretofore. And then here's how he here's how he ends the discussion. Does anyone want to read this? I'll read it. Okay. It is said that an Eastern monarch once charged his wise men to invent him a sentence to ever be in view, and which should be true and appropriate in all times and in all situations. They presented to him these words, and this too shall pass. How much it expresses, how chastening in the hour of pride, how consoling in the depths of affliction, and this too shall pass. And yet let us hope it is not quite true. Let us hope rather that by the best cultivation of the physical world beneath and around us, we shall secure an individual, social, and political prosperity and happiness 
whose course shall be onward and upward, and which, while the earth endures, shall not pass away. So I wish I got to read this speech in high school. I mean, that's, that's incredible. This is just, I mean, I think I probably would have understood much better what the United States presidency was if I would have read this when I was 16 years old or something like that. I mean, that should be, this should be a signed reading. I mean, you know, I mean, because you can take this, this, this right here, I mean, this is what the space program is. And this applies just as much to why go to space. And in fact, I can sort of hear Kennedy's speech in this speech, you know? Like, uh, does it really, you know, it, it, what is the actual immortal nature of mankind, um, right? Do, is, is, um, does it all just become the past? Or if we spend our lives in a way which is meaningful, uh, can we can can we actually see the eternity? And he says, um, you know, at least while the earth uh, continues to exist. But really with the space program, you could actually cross that part out and just actually say, and think about this conception of cultivating uh, mankind um, actually beyond the existence of the Earth itself. So I think this is very, very beautiful. And it struck me that um, we really need to, we need to go out. I mean, President Trump is obviously a very, very courageous person. And he has this conception of the power of the presidency. And he does bold things which clearly resonate with people in a way that we really haven't seen uh, maybe, since, maybe since Kennedy. Um, but this is clearly the office of the United States presidency is more than a person. It's an institution. And there's a, there's a principle here, which I think is in the Declaration of Independence, um, which can be made more explicit. And <clears throat> you know, by defeating, people think of the American Revolution in terms of the military campaign. But that was actually secondary. The American Revolution, the more primary aspect of the American Revolution was actually what was won with the Washington and Hamilton presidency in terms of what they established, what they, what Hamilton argued for, what was set into motion. And even though probably most of the presidents of the United States were, uh, may have done more harm than they even ever did good. But because you had a few of these presidents who actually embodied this principle, what you have is a longer arc, which has become part of our DNA. And I think what we have to help a lot of people understand a lot more, we can think about it in terms of the way in which people saw the American astronauts walking on the moon as we did this. It wasn't they did that, it's we did this. We realize that actually this principle is, is, is now, it is actually more part of the DNA of the rest of the world um, than what we might think. And I think because of that, uh, there is an underestimation of the degree to which harmonious cooperation among leaders who understand this principle can be affected. And so I, I think we have to really help people realize that, both about the institution of the United States presidency and in terms of why there is this coming together of a new paradigm of cooperation among leaders for the common aims of mankind. It has to do with a, a long-term historical arc, which is intersecting uh, this period in history. And uh, now that 
the coup against the president, at least a certain aspect of it, has been um, defeated. Now we are seeing the real potential of the United States presidency come to the fore. And uh, we've kicked open the door to a tremendous, um, a tremendous potential. Uh, in a sense, you can think of the defeat of the Mueller operation as the military campaign. And now what we have to set into motion um, is the real revolution.